Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the episode 6 of the Personalized Medicine Podcast. Today we are addressing one of the hottest topics in modern medicine, immuno-oncology, together with Dr. Stefan van Gogh. Stefan is a medical director of translational oncology at Immuno-Oncological Clinical Center in Cologne, Germany. This is one of the most advanced institutions of this kind in the country. Stefan has more than 25 years of experience in clinical oncology and related basic research. He has co-authored more than 150 research papers on the relationship between the immune system and cancer, and we will add the link to those publications in the show notes to this episode. I am very excited about this episode, and I hope to learn a lot about immune oncology from this interview. So, without further ado, Stefan, it is a great pleasure to welcome you on our podcast. It's a pleasure to me. Great, thank you. So, first, I would like to start with the events that happened rather not so long ago. About a year ago, a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded to the discovery of cancer therapy by inhibition of negative immune regulation. So I would like to ask you, what is the impact of the discoveries of James Ellison and Tasuku Honjo on the oncology in general, and why the topic of immune oncology is so popular, so hot today? Well, the problem of cancer is absolutely not solved till now. Um, in spite of optimized surgical approaches, uh, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapies, and so on and so on. All these therapies are in fact directed against the cancer. And um, only in the last uh, 20, 30 years, um, medical doctors and scientists realized that besides the cancer, there is also the body. And we have learned in these uh, last 30 years that we can use and manipulate the immune system also against uh, the cancer cells. And in fact, the Nobel Prize at 2018 for uh, uh, Jim Allison and Tasaku Honyo is a third event within the last 10 years. We may not forget that at 2011, the Nobel Prize for Medicine was given to um, uh, Ralf Steinmann and to uh, Beutler and to Hoffmann. Um, Ralf Steinmann was the person uh, from Rockefeller University who discovered the dendritic cell, which is in fact the most important antigen presenting cell. And Beutler and Hoffmann added to this insight that you need a danger signal to turn on the immune system. So that was in the last 10 years, a first major direction that shows that immunotherapy in the field of oncology starts to become important. Then we may not forget a second very major event, which was in fact in 2013, when science has called immunotherapy as the breakthrough of the year 2013 in the fight against cancer, showing that indeed with all different types of stimulated and manipulated immune cells, like the CAR T cells or TCR transduced T cells or dendritic cells or antibodies, you can really 
start to fight against the cancer. And then finally, um, Alison and Honjo have focused not only anymore on this second axis of fighting the cancer, so not the direct anti-tumoral activities, but also the immune system, then they have looked to the tumor-host interaction. How can the cancer go through an immune attack and try to avoid an immune attack? And they have discovered the issue of the checkpoint blockers. When cancer cells feel that there is potentially an immune attack, they upregulate molecules on their surface so that this immune attack is blocked. And of course, by blocking the blocking mechanism, you de-block the immune system and the immune system gets control over the cancer disease and you see a major and highly significant and also highly relevant increase of the overall survival of those patients who in fact would otherwise die due to this negative interaction from the tumor cell against the immune system. So that is in fact a um, third element uh, in the last 10 years that shows that immunotherapy is certainly the fourth pillar in the fight against cancer besides the surgical techniques, besides the radiotherapy techniques and besides the medical oncology uh, drug uh, technology. Great. Yeah, it sounds very promising, very interesting. And as you said, there are a lot of basic discoveries just in the field of immunology themselves, itself, um, even dendritic cells. We didn't know about them for a uh, quite long time, and now they are everywhere in the basic um, immunology uh, textbook. So perhaps I would like to follow up on your last point on those checkpoint inhibitors. So you said if we can show our immune system how to recognize um, tumors, we can uh, fight cancer in this way. So what has been happening on the clinical front? Has this checkpoint therapies already entered clinics and what was the success so far? Yes, sure. And that's also the reason why uh, Honjo and Alison have won the Nobel Prize. They have really discovered the mechanism at the preclinical level and within a short period of time they could uh, come with active antibodies into the clinical um, arena and uh, go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials and really demonstrate that these checkpoint blockers play a major role. The point is, of course, when do they play a major role? They only play a major role when there is an existing anti-tumoral immune response, which is then blocked by the checkpoint, like PD-1, um, like CTLA-4. That means if there is no spontaneous anti-tumor immune response, the checkpoint blockers will not work. And that can explain why, for instance, the uh, therapies with checkpoint blockers have an enormous clinical activity in tumors like melanoma and some types of lung cancer, because these are cancers with a high tumor mutation burden, so there are a lot of mutations, there are a lot of tumor antigens, and these tumors are somewhere more located at the surface of the body or in the lungs or in the skin, so that the triggering of the immune system and danger signals are also more present, so the chance that the immune system has started to fight against the melanoma of or the lung cancer is quite high. So these tumors had to solve the problem to survive and have upregulated the checkpoint um, molecules. And now we have learned to de-block the immune system by blocking these checkpoint blockers. So in those tumors, it is really working and it's, it's another world. 
and these treatments are even first-line treatments at the moment. However, in other cancers, like uh, the most frequent brain cancer, the glioblastoma multiforme, there there is no spontaneous anti-tumor immune reactivity. And that means that for these types of tumors, the checkpoint blockers will not work as a single agent approach. However, what we are learning at the moment, if we stimulate the immune system, if we actively learn the immune system to fight against such type of cancer, then we see that such type of cancer also starts to defend against the immune attack by upregulation of the checkpoint molecules and then the combination of an immune stimulation against such type of cancer together with the checkpoint inhibitor to allow the immune system to really get into the cancer and kill the tumor cells that is now current type of research which is going into clinical trials so the checkpoint blockers for some tumors are now the first line treatment and the checkpoint blockers for other types of cancers are to be used in combination with other strategies that first trigger the immune system to learn to fight against the cancer. Great, fantastic. This sounds very promising. So as you mentioned already, for some types of cancer, checkpoint inhibitors can, can be the first line of defense uh, in clinics. And for some, we still can use them to kind of boost the chances uh, of other uh, therapeutic approaches um, to actually work. So it seems like there is a big potential for personalized medicine, for personalized diagnostic and treatment approaches here. Uh, also, some types of cancer like breast cancer, um, so those tumors might respond differently, depends on the background of the patient, also the genetic background and those mutations that were happening before, as you mentioned. So how important it is to classify patients, to stratify them based on their gene tests or levels of specific biomarkers or their clinical history in order to know whether that checkpoint inhibition would work or not? Well, you, you come to a very, very, very challenging point in uh, modern uh, clinical research, uh, the, the, yeah, the conflict between personalized medicine on the one hand and uh, randomized clinical trials, protocol medicine on the other hand. And of course, uh, if you know more and more about the biology, of the tumor, about a clinical and molecular risk factors uh, for the patient, about the tumor host interaction, the terms cold tumors versus hot tumors are coming here. These all play a role in the ultimate outcome of the patients. And of course, if you want still to do randomized clinical trials, eventually placebo controlled with a control group, you have to stratify for all these novel risk factors that are now recognized as being very important. And that makes, in fact, that modern randomized clinical trials become very, very, very difficult because you need a large number of patients to overcome all these stratifications that are needed. And on top of that, the absolute readout of immunotherapy is not anymore a shift in progression-free survival, median progression-free survival, but is in fact an increase in percentage long-term overall survival. And also, from the statistics, we know that to have this readout as primary readout in your uh, clinical trial question, you will need much more patients. So it's becoming almost impossible to do an optimal um, clinical trial with immunotherapy. And I think and fear, but I think that's also the reason why it is so difficult to do immunotherapy um, clinical trials in a randomized way, 
outside of course the trials where the checkpoint blockers have been used as a single treatment approach for instance in the lung cancer in the uh, melanoma but once you come to uh, the second category as we have discussed where the checkpoint blockers are playing a role in addition to immune stimulatory uh, elements then you have personalization at the level of the tumor you have personalization at the level of the tumor host interaction and even you have partly personalization at your medicinal product because dendritic cells or CAR T cells or um, TCR transduced T cells they come from the patient him or herself so they are in fact already personalized and they are not one single um, element and that's the reason why it becomes very difficult but also very challenging and also very um, important for the patient because I think these uh, highly personalized approaches might give some solutions in the future for patients where the current way of performing clinical research is failing. I understand. Yeah, that seems like a very big challenge. On the one hand, we have those data from um, basic science that certain patients might respond better to certain type of uh, therapies. But on the other hand, you're absolutely right. It is extremely hard to conduct a randomized clinical trial because you need to perform to recruit patients based on so many certification criteria. And as you mentioned, nowadays, the primary outcome or the most important outcome that has to be measured is the long-term survival and not just, um, let's say, the short-term uh, postponing of uh, the lifespan. Yes, indeed. So I would like to continue in the direction of the activation of immune system. You mentioned although for that second type of, of therapies, when we can de-block uh, immune system, we still need to reactivate it further in order to fight cancer. So what are that approaches, what can be utilized? How can do? How can we boost our immune system to fight cancer? Yeah, um, the, um, we are we are facing uh, in part a change in paradigm. Um, so I have to uh, to split the answer in two elements. First of all, you have um, uh, now treatment strategies that really are aimed to stimulate the immune system against the, um, the cancer. And um, a very nice example are the dendritic cell vaccines. You isolate your dendritic cells out of the blood or you culture them out of monocytes in your laboratory. You load them with antigens. You give a major danger signal and then you have a mature dendritic cell that presents the antigen with all post-stimulatory molecules and a cytokine profile to be able to stimulate immune cells in the lymph nodes and the stimulated immune cells will go to the tumor to fight the tumor. Other pathways like the CAR T cells and the TCR transduced T cells, there in fact you manipulate and stimulate your immune cells in the laboratory and you infuse these manipulated and stimulated immune cells so that they directly fight the targets on the cancer cell. That is one part of the active immunization that we are doing. However, there are also other elements that come here into the picture. There are in fact anti-tumor agents and treatments that in fact have as a consequence an immune stimulation. An example for instance is the domain of the oncolytic viruses. It's in the world itself a virus that kills a cancer cell. That's why we call it an oncolytic virus. But we have learned over the time that in fact more important than the killing activity of this virus is the subsequent immunization due to the killing of the virus and such modes of killing we call that immunogenic cell death 
That is in fact a phenomenon which is now recognized as very important, but which is in fact very rare. Usually if a tumor cell or another cell dies in the body, the immune system doesn't take care of that happily enough, because otherwise we would explode in one minute. If the immune system would always react on a dying cell in the body, we would explode. So here we come now in the domain of immunogenic cell death. That means a type of cell death where the immune system is alarmed. And so in this second domain of immunization, you have in fact anti-tumoral strategies that as a consequence induces in the body an immune response. And a very typical example are the oncolytic viruses. But we are learning more. We know, for instance, that anthracyclines also in fact can induce immunogenic cell death so tumor cell killing with subsequent immune, immune reaction against the killed tumor cells. We know even now, and there is uh, research going on on that, that radiotherapy, if you give some modes of radiotherapy, some doses and some fractions, then in fact you induce an immunogenic cell death of the cancer cell and as a consequence the immune system is alarmed and starts to become active against the tumor. So to summarize this part you have the direct immune activating elements like dendritic cells or like manipulated T cells or manipulated NK cells. So that's on the one hand but on the other hand the treatments that are directed against the tumor to kill the tumor, some of them kill the tumor over the pathway of immunogenic cell death and as a consequence also can stimulate the immune system. And therefore, you see that also in clinical reality, there are for instance some trials where radiotherapy is now combined with checkpoint blockers. With radiotherapy you induce immunogenic cell death, you hope that the immune system becomes stimulated, that you create immune cells that fight against the cancer, and then you try to license these activated anti-tumoral immune cells to effectively kill the tumor cell. It's a real battle where, where you have um, different weapons that you can use and with um, a multiplication effect on top of that. And, and I think, um, certainly in, in, in modern oncology, I think if we can cure patients with anti-tumoral strategies, I don't think this is only because we have killed all the tumor cells. I think it is because we have killed most of the tumor cells and the immune system has become alarmed and stays in the body such type of tumor antigens we don't like that so we have induced an immunization and that's maybe in cancer why we can but rarely cure patients but we can reduce tumors and we usually see the relapse so that means if we now in future will kill tumor cells hopefully induce over the immunogenic cell death pathway and within body immune responsiveness against this cancer and we come on top of that then with active immune stimulations to strengthen this response and we finally come with the checkpoint blockers to license the immune response to effectively kill the tumor cells so with these three elements all together in the primary treatment, I think then we can in a major part improve the prognosis of patients with different types of cancers. Yeah, this sounds very promising. And as you said, we have those three ways uh, of approaching uh, cancer um, by reactivating our immune system, more classical now approach with CAR T cells or uh, by activating dendritic cells. But there is that third pathway through uh, immunogenic um, cell deaths. And you mentioned that we can 
achieve that, for example, uh, due to the radiotherapy, or we can also use oncolytic viruses. And I know that in your department in Cologne, you are uh, using one of those methods. So can you give a little bit more details on how oncolytic viruses can be utilized in clinics to fight tumors? Well, um, so the, this is also um, a world that is rapidly emerging in clinical reality. So uh, what we use at the IOZK is um, a very old and well-known virus, the Newcastle disease virus. Uh, this is in fact um, a virus in, in pool 3, um, which um, can be used also in human to fight against cancer because the oncospecificity of this oncolytic virus is based on the lack of interferon alpha production in tumor cells. So the normal healthy cells will defend against this virus while the tumor cell is sensitive to this virus. Um, and we have demonstrated um, in preclinical research with cell cultures and also with animal models that such virus, the Newcastle virus, really can kill tumor cells over the mechanism of immunogenic cell death, which is exemplified by HMGB1 secretion, ATP secretion, ectocal reticulin expression, increased antigen expression, infiltration of um, immune cells that express interferon gamma, depletion of M2 macrophages, depletion of myeloid derived suppressor cells. So the whole contexture of inflammation and immune system within the tumor is also changed due to this virus. Um, so that's all worked out molecularly. However, we have to say, and also we use the Newcastle disease virus because um, this is a very safe virus. It's in fact not a virus that it causes diseases in humans. So it's a very, very safe virus. But I know from other researchers uh, nowadays, and that's good news, um, that also other viruses are used um, in clinical practice, like the um, herpes um, virus, like the adenovirus. Uh, these viruses should be manipulated because otherwise they kill disease in human. Also the polio virus um, is used as oncolytic virus. The parvovirus is used as oncolytic virus. So there are many, many viruses. Their working mechanisms are different. The way how they are tumor specific are also different from virus to virus, but it's a whole domain that comes. And I think the global um, double action is accounting for all these viruses. They directly can kill tumor cells and they use an immunogenic cell death pathway to stimulate at the same time the immune system, not only against the virus, but also against the cancer cells. Yeah, that sounds very promising and really fascinating. So you also mentioned uh, that you are using dendritic cells uh, of the patient and you're training them outside of the organism and then re-inject them to the organism to fight cancer. Can you tell us a little bit more about this process? So what actually happens to the patient and uh, how do you boost uh, patient's immune system in this way? Well, um, so we have um, the patients um, come in um, and we use um, monocyte derived dendritic cells. So that means that the patient has to give a um, blood sample, let's say about 200 milliliters. These um, uh, blood uh, vials go to our GMP facility. In the GMP facility, we isolate the monocytes and we start a differentiation period of five days so that the monocytes are differentiated in the presence of IL-4 and GMCSF towards immature dendritic cells. At day five, we have these immature dendritic cells and then we can load these immature dendritic cells with tumor antigens and for that there are several sources. Once these immature dendritic cells are loaded with these tumor antigens, then we come in with danger signals and we use a cytokine cocktail 
but we also use at this stage the Newcastle virus. And then some days later, at day 8, we have a mature dendritic cell that presents the tumor antigens in the context of the MHC molecules, but also the Newcastle disease virus. And that's now an approved medicinal product within Germany that we are allowed to produce and that we are allowed to use as medical treatment for the patient. So I think we are the only one who have a dendritic cell together with an oncolytic virus in it as an approved medicinal product. And I think that's the um, credit of the CEO of uh, the IOZK, Dr. Stücke, that he managed to set up this whole um, cascade of events and, and to tackle all the challenges during this, but finally ending with an approved advanced therapy medicinal product. Then these dendritic cells are injected intradermally in the patient at day eight of the culture. And upon this injection of the dendritic cells intradermally, they are aimed to move to the lymph nodes to stimulate there in the T-cell zone of the lymph nodes the immune cells, so that ultimately these immune cells will go into the direction of the tumor cells and recognize the tumor cells over the tumor antigens, but also recognize the tumor cells over their infection with the Newcastle disease virus, because I've already said only the tumor cells are infected with the Newcastle disease virus. So also virally infected tumor cells will be recognized by the stimulated immune system after the vaccination with um, the dendritic cells. Very nice. Yeah, it's a very interesting protocol and uh, it's very exciting how one can train dendritic cells in the lab outside of the human's body. And I have one short follow-up question on that. So in order to for dendritic cells to recognize those antigens, or first to, to present those antigens to, to the rest of the uh, immune system, you'll need to uh, either provide the dendritic, cultured dendritic cells with a tumor biopsy uh, or with some other source of those tumor antigens. Is it possible in theory, for example, to use recombinant tumor proteins or other sort of antigens as carbohydrates, glycans, to um, load those dendritic cells in vitro? Yeah, so there you, you tackle an, an important issue. I've said we, we have different sources of tumor antigens. First of all, at this stage, we have to take into account um, the approved GMP procedures. So it's not any more um, experimentation and, and try to, 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 to see what is the best. It's, it, these are GMP approved processes um, that are very strictly regulated. So we can use two um, elements of a source of tumor antigen. First of all, we can obtain tumor material and then make a lysis out of these tumor cells. And then we can load the immature dendritic cells with such tumor lysis, which in fact covers all the antigens. Or we can stimulate in the patient the immunogenic cell that with oncolytic virus therapy, and we use also modulated electrohyperthermia. This is another mode of local tumor cell killing, inducing immunogenic cell death. And then we know if we do that, we get an increase of broken tumor cell fragments in the blood of the patient. This is in the domain of liquid biopsy, and we call that antigenic extracellular microvesicles on the one hand and apoptotic bodies on the other hand. So if you look in the world of extracellular vesicles, you have the exosomes and they are less than 100 nanometer. Then you have the extracellular microvesicles, they are 100 to 1000 nanometer. And you have the apoptotic bodies, which are a little bit more than 1000 nanometer. So, and we know that the 
extracellular microvesicles contain the MHC molecules and the antigens, and also the apoptotic bodies contain the MHC molecules and the antigens, and we can use these elements also to load our immature dendritic cells in the laboratory. The advantage of using antigenic extracellular microvesicles and apoptotic bodies is the following. If we have a tumor and this patient has, for instance, to go through radiotherapy and chemotherapy as an adjuvant treatment, and you then only come in with your dendritic cell vaccine, then you are several months after the resection of the primary tumor. That means that eventual residual tumor cells in the body are already changed due to the selection of the radiotherapy and the chemotherapy. So you can imagine that the antigenicity of potential residual tumor cells at that time will be different as compared to the antigenicity of the resected tumor at time of first diagnosis. So if we use the system of extracellular microvesicles and apoptotic bodies that we induce at that time of vaccination due to treatment with oncolytic virus and hyperthermia, then we have an actualized antigenic panel for loading our dendritic cells. And that's one of the directions where we are now working on because we think if we consider tumors as a dynamic process, changing clones goes up, other clones goes down, then it is for us the best way to use the antigens that are present at the time of vaccination and not the historical antigens that were present at time of tumor resection. Absolutely, that sounds very promising and yeah, in this way we can combine that uh, recent development in liquid biopsy and uh, development in biochemistry uh, and purification protocols of uh, different sorts of vesicles from the blood and then use those uh, antigens that are, as you said, present at that very moment in the patient's body to train dendritic cells, to train the immune system overall. We are doing this show for you and your feedback is very important to us. So if you have any suggestions or comments, would like us to cover a specific topic or recommend a person we should interview, please write us an email to team at personalizedmedicinemedia.com or you can just reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Just type in Personalized Medicine Podcast and you will find us there. To make sure that you won't miss the new episodes of our show, please subscribe to the newsletter at our website personalizedmedicinemedia.com It's one word, personalized medicine media, spelled with Z as in American English. Our website is also the place where you can find show notes for each episode that include bios of our guests, links to their most notable work and projects, and follow-up reads on the topics we discuss during the episode. And now, let's get back to the interview. You obviously deal with lots of the patients at AOZK. Uh, From the patient's perspective, how does their journey look if they um, require that immunostimulation therapy, for example, using uh, IOVAC? Well, um, so there are, again, um, two, um, two scenarios. Let's, let's call it scenario. Um, the first scenario is uh, the patient um, gets some surgery and um, radiotherapy um, and or uh, chemotherapy and then come to us. So then we give um, the vaccine as adjuvant to the uh, situation of that moment. Um, that means this patient gets an immuno-oncologic evaluation and an immunodiagnostic blood sampling where we look um, how is the immune system in number of cells and function of cells? How is the tumor-host interaction? 
how are general elements present that support the immune system and some legally obliged um, uh, blood analysis have also to be done in such immunodiagnostic blood sampling. Then some days later the patient can start with a first eight day vaccination cycle um, and gets at day eight the vaccine as I have already described. Then three weeks later we give a second vaccination cycle and at day eight the vaccine is given. And then again, three weeks later, um, the patient comes for an immunomonitoring blood sampling and starts with five days maintenance immunogenic cell death therapy. Then we only give the oncolytic virus and the hyperthermia, where we in fact mark locally uh, where tumor cells are potentially present and the stimulated immune system can then jump on it and try to get control over it. And then such a maintenance five days immunogenic cell death therapies, they are then repeated each four to six to eight weeks depending on the oncologic status of the patient but also depending on the feasibility for the patients. We have patients coming from 67 countries to the IOZK and of course patients who come from Australia or Japan cannot come that regularly to Köln. That is of course evident as just logistic elements. So that's one scenario, an induction immunotherapy with two cycles of dendritic cell vaccines and then a maintenance therapy. However, I have also already said it is for us very important that we try to include already the axis of the immune system together with the axis of the anti-tumoral treatment strategies. So therefore we have been thinking how can we already introduce the immune system within the standard chemotherapy. For instance, glioblastoma patients, they get 6 to 12 months cycles of maintenance chemotherapy. Well, such 5 days chemotherapy like timozolomid. Timozolomid is aimed to kill tumor cells and the mode of killing is in fact as alkylating agent, a change in the genetic structure and once the tumor cell divides, the tumor cell will die. That's the way it goes. That means the tumor cell that does not divide will not die. That means also that the glioma cancer stem cells will not be sensitive to the timosolomid. So therefore, if you then combine a genetic way of tumor cell killing together with an immunogenic cell death mechanism, you can easily combine these two. So that's a second scenario where we already give immunogenic cell death therapy with oncolytic virus and hyperthermia together with the chemotherapy in first-line setting. And when the chemotherapy is then completely finished, then we start with our two full vaccination cycles with dendritic cells and then we go further with the maintenance immunotherapy. So that are in fact the two major strategies that we are working on at the moment and the patients have uh, in, in the situation of Köln uh, with us at the IOZK, the patients receive these treatments in an ambulant setting in a sort of daycare center um, so they have to cover the own hotel and um, and travel, um, but we usually also do not see um, major toxicities, so that most of the patients manage that in a quite easy way. Great, and you just mentioned that you have patients from about sixty-seven countries around the world, and I guess for many of them this was a life-changing or maybe life-saving uh, therapy. And uh, I would like to continue a little bit on that, since you are serving so many patients at IOZK, there is a problem that other hospitals, they can't just do it either because uh, the technology is still not there, the qualifications, the 
uh, talent is not there uh, in the hospitals, or perhaps there are other roadblocks uh, in the broad adoption of uh, immunotherapies in uh, clinics overall. So which challenges do you see from the regulatory perspective and from the organizational perspective in terms of broad adoption of immunotherapies? Yeah, um, challenges that I fear uh, are nowadays not to be overcome, uh, unfortunately, because it, it's really very difficult. So as I have already explained, uh, we have the approval of our vaccine, the IOVAC, as an advanced therapy medicinal product, which can be used in human. And we can treat patients under a special uh, framework which is present in Germany and which is called individueller Heilverzoog. So a doctor is contacted by a patient, asks for a particular therapy because uh, there is no solution in the standard of care and the doctor and this patient can explain to each other what is the issue, can sign an informed consent and the doctor can treat the patient with this IOVAC advanced therapy medicinal product. However, as I have already said, we are the only one who have this as an approved medicinal product. That means that all other university hospitals and other um, institutions, they have uh, eventually the possibility to um, produce dendritic cell vaccines as an investigational medicinal product, not as an approved, but as an investigational medicinal product. That means only to be used within a clinical trial. And then you come to all the problems that we have already mentioned with the stratification and the number of patients, but you come also with huge logistic problems and costs because if you are doing a clinical trial as a researcher or a sponsor you have to pay for all the administration in the good clinical practice issue and you have to pay for your investigational medicinal products so that means the costs are huge and it's almost not affordable. I'm just um, writing down a paper on the challenges of randomized clinical trials with immunotherapy in the domain of glioblastoma multiforme. I've looked um, about two weeks ago in uh, the clinicaltrials.gov. There are now five randomized clinical trials going on in the domain of glioblastoma um, with dendritic cell vaccines. To my view, having said all what we have already said, with too low number of patients, but it should be manageable for those sponsors to get it paid and to get it organized. If we see to the bigger trials, and there was one trial in Leuven, who has stopped by the sponsor, although all the data are present and are meanwhile published under other study names in literature. Two companies have also set up very big randomized clinical trials, but one trial has already published that they had to stop their recruitment for three years because the finances were not present. And the third trial has been stopped, has been suspended at the moment, it's indicated as such even in the trials.gov, because there is no money. So that means if your ambition becomes to what it should be, and when you have tried to tackle all the scientific and statistical issues, then you still run into problems apparently, that's just description what is happening in the world, then you run into problems with finances and with organization of such types of clinical trials. That's the reality. And so I have no solution at all. I only can say for the patients of today, we have to find a solution. And I think that is maybe uh, the niche where we are now active. So we have 
this approved medicinal product so we can treat patients so that means in fact the patient who needs such type of treatment and who is willing to use such opportunity we simply have to do it on a person per person basis very highly personalized personalized at the level of the machinery of the tumor personalized at the level of the surface of the tumor personalized at the level of the tumor host interaction personalized at the level of the advanced therapy medicinal product personalized at the level of response to treatment personalized at the level of combination of treatments and complementary medicines and that's in a dynamic process because the tumor and the immune system is changing over time the last is even also for me a becoming a bigger problem if we put patients into protocols that are fixed but we know that the tumor is changing over time the question is how long will we hold patients on fixed protocols while we know that the tumor is changing so that the protocol is not anymore adapted to the tumor and unfortunately the tumor does not adapt to the protocol yeah that's a really big challenge because it's just one thing to develop the therapies themselves but then it's even a bigger problem to bring them to clinics and it shouldn't be like that it's really sad because we need desperately need many of those therapies in clinics but i would like to finish with you on a more positive note and uh, take an outlook into the future so i would like to put a magic wand into your hands and ask you what would be the three developments in the immune oncology that you would like to see in the next 10 years what can really be a game changer well um i would say three times combination 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 uh, because i think that is uh, what what will be uh, to my view the the future i think uh, we have to work very hard to improve the technologies of personalized uh, cell products but um, using them as single agents we have already said it uh, i don't think that's a smart way to proceed we have to combine with the anti-tumoral strategies with oncolytic viruses uh, with the checkpoint blockers um, so we really have to to make um, intelligent combinations um, adapted to the situation of each patient uh, that is uh, to my view very important um, that would be my dream a second dream really would be uh, that um, the um, um, how would I say the organization of personalized medicine and see how um, authorities and also insurance companies deal with highly personalized um, medical approaches uh, and not only rely on phase three randomized clinical trials where such complex treatments are failing as i have explained um, so there i hope at the uh, political um, level and, and um, health economic level that they also start to become innovative to see how we have to deal with this problem i would also like that the induction of costs would be a little bit more normalized because all these quality controls that we have to do are absolutely all not evidence-based uh, it's just somebody who thinks it should be like that and then it, it is like that but that's not always evidence-based and i think the panel has been swing a little bit too much into into one direction while the reality is a little bit uh, should be a little bit more in the middle i think um we should really reorganize the whole system i have uh, 
one one um, one figure always in my mind. If you uh, plot on the x-axis um, the um, level of quality control, so from low to more and more and more and more on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis you plot advantage of the patient. Then of course you can imagine the more quality you deliver the more the advantage of the patient but if your quality um, instructions become so high then at the end the advantage for the patient is again going down because the accessibility for the patient is reduced it's not any more payable for the patient and there i think we should find a way in between to keep the costs under control and still having an optimal quality that is more or less evidence-based. So that would be also one dream. And I think the last dream that I would have is really um, that um, yeah, people communicate more together um, on all these aspects uh, because I have still, unfortunately, still the impression that once you come into the domain of immunotherapy, most oncologists start to suffer a little bit because it's not a world, it's not anymore oncology, it's immunology. And I think, um, for instance, there, there are no training programs within oncology training that really explain in depth all the secrets of immunology and inflammation and i think we should really train our next generation oncologists that they should not only work on directing against the tumor but also directing in favor of the patient and the immune system of the patient that's half of the job should become still in the training of modern oncologists so so therefore I have said combination, combination, combination. So combination of all these treatment modalities already in the primary setting, um, combining health economics, quality control and all these elements and keep it manageable and realistic. And then uh, combining already in the training module anti-tumoral oncology with immuno-oncology. Also in the training of modern oncologists. Great. I hope all of these wishes will come true because we really need that. We really need more efficient system and we need more uh, doctors that uh, will be well versed in uh, all the new recent developments in uh, basic research. And that's also something that we are trying to do with this podcast to bridge the gap between research and uh, clinics and also entrepreneurship uh, and decision makers who are actually in charge of creating policies. So Stefan, thank you so much for being uh, today with us on this podcast. This was very exciting. I've learned a lot uh, about immune oncology, about the challenges, and I hope that we will overcome them. And in the very end, I would like to ask you if any of our listeners uh, would like to reach out to you. For example, they would like to join you, your group at IOZK, or they just have any question about immune oncology. How can they do it? Where can they find you? Well, the website is uh, uh, iozk.de and uh, the general email address is info at iozk.de. That works always, and um, then at the end, uh, if there is contact over info at iozk.de, then this email normally comes to me. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. The easiest way to do it is on LinkedIn or Twitter, where you can find us just by typing in personalized medicine podcast and don't miss the next episode yourself for this subscribe to the newsletter on our website personalizedmedicinemedia.com we also publish the show notes for each episode there that include our guests bios links to their most notable work and recommendations for additional reads on the topic of the episode 
And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest us a guest for the show, write us an email to team at personalizedmedicinemedia.com or reach out to us on Twitter or LinkedIn. Have a great day and until next time.